our Turing machine from last time, uh, which was uh, our addition Turing machine. And I've made ver a very slight change uh, to it. Uh, very, very minor. Nothing, nothing horrendously uh, earth shattering. All right. So this was the, um, the machine that we talked through last time, the add one machine. And um, it. Uh, go ahead. What do you think the door being locked means? Class starts at 11. Okay, so uh, the, um, the machine that we had last time, um, I, I think we talked about this, but I made the change of, uh, what are we gonna use as our valid symbols? I think when I did it on paper, I used a star, right? Let's change that to an X instead of a star, okay? Not a real big deal, but the reason that I changed it is because um, in order for us to use this simulator, um, the simulator uses the, ash, the star uh, for three different things, okay? What does it mean? Uh, if, uh, you, if it's in a current cell, you just, uh, uh, meaning like, for example, the overflow case here, what happens if you hit an overflow? Well, it doesn't matter what you read, okay? So really that's a shorthand for three different rows where you have overflow for zero or one or X. So there we're just saying, we don't care what symbol is read. Uh, we do the same thing in any of the situations, okay? Um, if you see a star in the value to write, you could interpret that as, and, the, and the, the simulator does it, as don't change what's there. Just leave it as it was, whatever it was, okay? And then finally, is if you have a star in the don't or sorry in the move direction we'll just make that well don't move okay now the don't move is really only useful in the halt state or going into the halt state because otherwise there's you, you sort of get, would get stuck right um so uh yeah we'll use that uh so that when we enter the halt state the head read head stays on top of the x rather than moving to the right of the x okay does that make sense Okay, the other thing about the simulator um, notation, uh, and we'll just use this notation uh, both when we use the simulator and for other stuff, which is to say, um, let me copy that and go to the simulator. Oops. And put that in. Um, and then... Okay, two things. One, what was the initial state that we used last time? I think it was this, right? Or sorry, um, uh, one zero one in between two X's. That was our tape from last time. Okay, so what does the star indicate in the initial input? Where the head is, okay? And the, so the star will go directly to the left of the symbol of the, uh, that the head's on top of. Um, and we don't have to just use this for the initial input, okay? Uh, we can use this to mean the tape looks like this at each stage along the execution path, okay? So when I was drawing this last time on the iPad, I, you know, used like a green arrow or something to, so we knew where the head was. Well, if I'm trying to type this out, I can't really do that. So I'll just use a star immediately to the left of the symbol where the head is, and that way, we can type all this out too. Okay, is that all right? Okay, and then finally, you have to hit advanced options to get the option to say what initial state the machine is in. And in the case of our example, what initial state were we in? What did we call the state uh, when you're starting? We just called it the start state, right? Okay, then you have to hit reset and it loads all of that stuff in and then you can hit run and it will do it. And then you can see up here at the top, okay, that's the, the final configuration of the tape. Was that correct? Yeah, okay, that was good. Um, and the head there is above the rightmost X. Um, 
And so what's uh, if I wanted us to write down what the final configuration is of the tape, then what would we write down? X one one zero star X because the head ends up on the right hand X. Okay. Um, and so when we build our uh, next Turing machine, okay, um, we'll do it in such a way that we'll we'll kind of keep with this convention of uh, we'll have the head return to the far right uh, of the and so that it's on top of the X, which is where it started, and the rest of the tape is what gets modified. Okay, we don't have to do it that way. Um, we could have the tape start at the left. Okay or whatever, it doesn't really matter, but we have to have a, we have to have a convention, okay? Um, and so this way, if we all have the same convention of uh, this, then uh, our Turing machines will be in some way, like we'll be able to communicate them to each other, right? Because we all know we're kind of talking in the same language. Okay, good. All right, the last thing to mention here is, um, you'll notice that, of course, that the, uh, the table, if you will, is uh, uh, in the, the quote program for the Turing machine, that's really just a table, right? And so how do I read this? State, letter red, letter to right, which direction does the head move, L or R, and what state do you enter after that happens, okay? And really that's all a Turing machine is, right? It's a list of symbols and a, and a table of instructions in some sense, okay? And then the only other thing here about the, um, uh, right, is let's remind ourselves, what do the asterisks mean? If you're reading a symbol, what does asterisk mean, or star? Could be anything. So any symbol could be there. If it's in the right position, what does it mean? Write what was already there. So don't change what was already there. And then um, if it's in the move position, what does it mean? Don't move, okay? Uh, now, one other thing here is um, the guy who programmed this, okay, this is of course case sensitive, so upper and lower case makes a difference. Um, notice the L's, right? They're lowercase L, and it's maybe not so horrible here on the computer screen, but lowercase l and the digit one look pretty similar, especially when you're writing this by hand. Yes? Okay. So when we write this by hand on the chalkboard uh, or on paper or something, do one of two things. Either use a capital L, so it's really obvious, uh, or use kind of like a scripty L, so it really looks like different from the digit one, and that'll just save you from getting confused. Okay. But in terms of uh, the, the thing here, uh, it has to be lowercase l and r because that's how he programmed it, okay? That's fine. We just have to, to keep that in mind. Okay, the last thing about the simulator I want to say is um, when I have you guys build a Turing machine or two for an assignment, you're actually going to just, uh, all you have to do is uh, put the table into the simulator and then do the following. Okay, so let me reset it back to our initial state. Okay, so this is where we started, and if I hit this button, save to the cloud, what it will give me is a URL, okay, so a link, and all you guys will have to do to, quote, turn in your Turing machine is give me this link, okay? And if I click on said link, then what it'll do is open up your simulator with everything pre-configured, and so I can look at your stuff. Like, I don't have to type or copy and paste anything in. I can just look at how you set it up, hit run, see what happens, okay? Um, this also means that uh, from your perspective, right, you, I mean, you certainly could copy and paste all this stuff into a, a document uh, to keep track of your own work, but you don't have to, right? You can just copy and paste the URL and that'll preserve everything, okay? So that's kind of handy, yeah, I would think. Okay, good. Okay, so what was this Turing machine for anyway, the, the one that we, we've already looked at, what did it do? It added one to a given number, okay? It's not true addition, right? Because I'm not adding two given numbers. I'm just adding one to a specific number. Okay, so 
uh, two things we'll, we'll sort of talk about today. Um, one is, well, if we can build a machine to add one, could we build a machine to subtract one? Theoretically, yeah. Okay, and we'll, we'll go through that. It'll be yeah, relatively similar to this machine, but some things will change. Um, and then furthermore, um, could we uh, conceive, for example, of building a machine that flips all the bits, right? So changes all the ones to zeros and all the zeros to ones. Okay, yeah, we'd have to go through some details to figure out how it would work, but, but we could make such a thing, okay? All right, well, if we can build a machine that flips all the bits, and we already have another machine that can add one, what happens when we put those two things together? That allows us to do the two's complement kind of computations, okay? So that's a sort of a specific example, but let's maybe think bigger picture here. If I have a Turing machine that can do thing one, and I have another Turing machine that can do thing two, what do you think I could do? Could I pipe them together in some way, right? So like, could I take the output of the first Turing machine and use it as the input for another Turing machine? Yeah, okay. And if we thought about it really hard, maybe we could figure out a way to sort of combine them so that it's one single Turing machine. Seem reasonable? Okay, so what this means is if we want to understand um, what is computable, right, or that a computer programming language is, quote, Turing complete, then all we have to do is make sure that the primitive little pieces that the language is built out of can be implemented with the Turing machine. And then we can be content that combining two things that are Turing machinable itself is Turing machinable. Okay, so does this kind of idea make sense? So Turing complete, what does that mean? So a language is said to be Turing complete means that it can be implemented with a Turing machine. Okay, or any program written in that language can be implemented with the Turing machine. It suffices for us to show that we can build all of the primitive pieces of the language with individual Turing machines, because then, of course, a, a program is just a combination of all of these things, right? So, for example, uh, I would need to be able to show how to do a loop type thing with a Turing machine. And if I could do that, then we're good, okay? Uh, or incrementing or decrementing, which means adding or subtracting one from another. Can we build that with a Turing machine? Well, we've already got the Turing machine in front of us for the add case. What about the subtract case? Well, we'll come up with it today. That's our kind of task. Okay. And similarly, what about for uh, if then else kind of constructions or something? Could we come up with a Turing machine that could implement that kind of thing? Okay. Um, and so that's kind of where we'll go with this uh, early next week. Um, is sort of to try and step away from the Turing machines a little bit um, to say, okay, the Turing machine is it's a perfectly good theoretical construct, right? And for simple things, it's not all that hard to figure out what's going on. But is it practical to, to, to actually program in Turing machine, if you will? Is this really practical for like a really, like would I write a video game in this language? Oh, hell no. Right. So I would want to have another language that's somehow more practically usable, but I want to know that with that language, I'm not somehow missing something. Right. Because I could imagine making a language where I could do a lot of cool stuff, but I can't quite do everything that a Turing machine could. And then said language would be not Turing complete, and that's somehow not good enough. Okay. So. Uh, this idea of Turing completeness is, is something, like I said, we'll look at uh, more next time. Okay. Um, so, does this kind of make sense, the, the drill? All right. So, you guys maybe saw yesterday or today that uh, I've posted some new assignments uh, for the next week or so worth of stuff. And for the Turing machine assignment, I've divided it really in two pieces. Turing machine assignment A is you're going to use this Turing machine but with a different tape uh, input, okay? And step through every step of the execution. What state is it in? What symbol are you reading? What symbol are you gonna write? Which way is it gonna move? What state do you enter? And it turns out for that one that there are 
uh, 30 such uh, pieces of information, right? But you want to step through each individual thing and do it kind of on uh, paper, kind of like we did last time with uh, whatever input we picked, okay? Does that make sense? Okay, so, yes, so I've specified the starting value of the tape and um, that question has a link to this Turing, uh, the table on Canvas or this website, okay? So you can see what the, what the actual machine is, but it's, the, it's just the plus one machine, right? So this is the other thing. Do you know what the final answer should look like? Of course, right? Because you can just look at the number and add one and, and you know what the final configuration ought to be. But what I want you to do, right, is trace through every single uh, step of the, the execution of the Turing machine to make sure you actually get to that final state. Okay, good? We? Okay, excellent. All right, so Turing machine assignment B, uh, which I haven't fully posted yet, that's where you guys will be creating a Turing machine and giving me a link. Okay, so it's a different um, exercise. Okay, so does that kind of make sense, kind of where this is going? We? Okay. All right, so at this point, I think it's probably good to, uh, we'll go ahead and kill the stream a little early, and uh, let's get to work on some paper and chalkboard, and I'll tell you kind of what the, the objective for today is. Okay? Good? All right.